episode of actually the luncheon fountain at Foley's in Houston was so peaceful and went, went so peacefully that afterward I thought it was a setup. I thought Foley's had probably invited somebody to do it. I mean, it was, there was, it was so different from, them from what you went through. We just went in, some blue-haired lady said, ah, and that was it. It was integrated. I know you guys got to catch up. But so, we'll yeah, we really yeah. should, I should, know, we should probably start. Yes. So, uh, okay. I, I guess we should officially introduce this. <laughs> um, so, this is uh, Ryan Morini with the Sam Proctor Oral History Program. I'm sitting down with uh, Rabbi Hanan Sills in St. Augustine on uh, June 17th, 2014. Uh, should we introduce everyone else in the room or just quickly? Mm -hmm. oh. No? Okay, we'll skip that. Um, well, just your first name, at least. Oh, mine? Yeah. Well, yeah. oh, they know mine. Uh, Deborah. <laughs> Deborah? Deborah. Deborah, my daughter's name. Good name. It is a good name. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so... And I know everybody else. So if I might ask, uh, when were you born? <laughs> Long story. 2735. Two seven thirty five, and I have to remember because it's my sister's birthday. And, and where it was our tradition. Mm -hmm. My mother was, my mother had her brother born February fifth, and she was born February fifth. Their birthday was the same day. Our birthday was the same day. So I thought all families are like that. They all have birthdays on mm -hmm. the same day. But that's <laughs> what a family was. I see. Um, and where were you born? Plainfield, New Jersey. And is that where you grew up as well? It is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in a multi-generational, uh, multi-ethnic neighborhood, which was considerable because a lot of the Jewish community grew up in a certain section in town, which was more ghettoized for the upper middle class, hmm. and my parents were poor. And um, our back of our yard, the back of the African American family's yard, touched where, where, they, where they had their chickens, and I used to hang out talking with them. So I grew up really. Uh, with 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 the with the blessings of that, although I didn't know I was Jewish until I was seven. So. Oh, but was that a revelation for you, or? Well, I didn't. I had never heard the word. I knew my parents. My parents had family that was from Europe, and I heard the word Europe, and they lived in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. and that was my grandparents and cousins. But I'd never heard the word Jewish. My grandparents were actually Orthodox. I just thought this is what European people do, <laughs> and. Uh, First time I heard it was when two Irish. I knew they were Irish because they were always talking about Irish is the best. And there were two boys and they were walking home from public school and I was walking with them and they got in a fight and I broke up the fight. I often did that with these two kids. And the kid who was losing uh, was angry about it. The kid who was winning was glad that I did. So the kid who was winning the fight said, red, white, and blue, your mother is a Jew, your father is an Irishman just like you. That was the poem, one of my first poems I heard. <laughs> so, red, white, blue, your mother is a Jew. What does that mean? I knew what Irishmen meant because they were both Irish. <laughs> and the kid who was losing the fight, so he said, red, white, and blue, blah, blah, blah. The other kid said, yeah, you're a dirty, I said, Jew, what is that? He said, you're a dirty Jew. And I said, I'm not dirty, I take baths. I, in my bath, you know, we have these boats that I put in my boat. And so, <laughs> I know what the hell he was talking about. So... I come home and um, I ask my mom, what does the word Jew mean? What I didn't know at the age of seven was that's when the Wannsee conference was happening by the Nazis. That's when they were meeting to decide to annihilate the Jewish people and how to go about doing it. That's what the Wannsee conference was about. I didn't know that. I didn't know that till I was after a rabbi years later. What was that about? But somehow or other, something, now, as I look back on my life, I know that was a pivotal moment, the revelation of the fact that I was a Jew. And when I went home and asked my parents, what does it mean? And they said, well, that's our religion. Well, what does religion mean? Well, hey, you don't worry about that. When you're bar mitzvah, what does bar mitzvah mean? When you're 13 year old, you go through this. I said, well, do you, you learn about it? They said, yeah, you learn about it. And, I said, why can't I start learning now? You don't need that shit. <laughs> my father said, excuse me, quote, Dad, right? You said those words. Yeah, I did. He, he, he grew up with Orthodox Jewish parents, and he felt his mother was pushing it down his throat. And when he was playing with the Sabbath candles, 
his mother said, you don't play with the Sabbath candles. And uh, this is a story he tells me later. And um, at that point, she came over and she gave him a good zets with her fist, knocked him on the ground, and he said, I was done with religion from that time on. So he said, but you have a bar mitzvah. <laughs> so a true story. And uh, so I started to inquire, and I found, I said to my mom, are there any other Jewish, these Jewish people in our, where I go to school, Irving School, which only went up to the fifth grade? She said, yeah, Augusta Falk, who's in your class, and her brother Barry. So I said, well, I'm going to wait till they come home from school and I'll wait for them and get to talk with them, which is what I did. And I said, I, I just found out I'm Jewish. What does that mean? And Barry said, you got to go to Hebrew school. He was teasing <laughs> me here. And he said, if you don't go to Hebrew school, I'll beat you up. And I said, come on. What is it? He said, ask your parents. But it's a good thing for you to go to Hebrew school. He said, you go after public school. So I come home and I ask my parents about that. And my father's, you know, at that point said, you don't need this. And, and I said, I want to know about it. So he said, there's a ritual. I may be repeating myself. I don't want to miss this. He said, there's a ritual called bar mitzvah when you're 13. So when you're 12, you'll find out about it, and then you'll be done with it. I mean, he, he'd had it. But Jewish, yes. And he's the guy who, when he worked at Bambergers in, at one point in his life, when he left r &S Auto Stores, he worked at Bambergers. And... Um, there was a guy in the bus who was telling bad jokes and says, is anybody here Jewish? And my father didn't say anything. And then he started telling really anti-Semitic jokes. So my father didn't get off at Bamberger's where he usually got off. He got off where this guy got off. And he told this guy. And he cold cocked him. You don't talk about people. You don't talk about my people that way. It's a, it's a strange thing. You know, here, here, <laughs> he was fed up with the religious part of it. Somehow, and his son becomes a rabbi. <laughs> what a disappointment! <laughs> I didn't go to Rutgers College of I did go to Rutgers College of Pharmacy. I didn't commit suicide like the guy in the Dead Poet Society. I just oh, yeah. left pharmacy school and decided I'm going to go to Rutgers, New Brunswick, and study history. And I did, and got on the uh, uh, radio station, and got into theater and music, which was a lot of my life. I come from a family of my mother with uh, eight children in the family. Uh, six of them became professional musicians. It was in the genes, and for me, music was always and is still is very important, both jazz and classical and Hebrew music. I used to be a cantor. I, I've worked as a cantor as well. And I love chanting, and now my voice is getting higher, but <laughs> as, as the estradiol comes into the body. But um, anyway, let me let you lead it, and I'll answer and respond. Well, that, I mean, that was fantastic so far, but so how did you uh, end up on the path to becoming a rabbi then? What, what exactly happened? Somehow it always brings a Danny Kay song for me. It all, it all began when I was born a month too soon. My mother was frightened by a runaway saloon. My pa was a hobo. He played the oboe, which is clearly understood as an, old, an ill wind that no one blows good. I'll never forget the morning that Grandpa ate an awning to impress a pretty lady who went for men who were shady. Uncle Josiah, with the great Fisco fire, went off to Hawaii with the O'Leary cow, which his loving wife resented, and thereupon invented a rolling pin that strikes and then says, pow. And I'm the results of a twisted eugenics and family of inborn schizophrenics. An end of a long, long line of quacks. I design women's hats. I'm Antoine of Paris, and so on. So there was always the ham, kosher ham in me. And still is there, thank God. Because uh, I can get very intense. The other part of me is very intense. And uh, like about being Jewish and about uh, anti-Semitism and about anti-blackism -black and about all that shit. It's just not okay. It's not okay. When did you first become involved with anti-racist activism in particular? Well, I should say I grew up in the neighborhood that was adjacent to the African-American neighborhood. Mm. But there was segregation, too. I mean, the, the African-American family lived around the corner, which got to be Third Street in Plainfield, which was okay to begin to have African-American families there. But the rest of the block was kind of interesting. It was German, Irish, Italian, French, English, all on one block. I don't know that they make neighborhoods like that anymore that have still the consciousness 
So the lady next door, for example, and the man next door, this was interesting because I learned an important lesson about life. This guy was a policeman, and he was a son of a bee. He was really a mean son of a bee. And they had a cherry tree, and the cherry tree grew into our yard. And I was told you can pick a tree from the tree if it grows into your yard from that part of it. So he took his gun to me. His son committed suicide, by the way, their only child. I think he might have been gay and ended up killing himself. And the father was a mean bastard. He really was. And the old lady just tried to let him go off to work and I'll live my life. But she became a friend. And when she met me, I was in a carriage and I was crying. I was an infant. We had just, my parents had just moved to that neighborhood. And she picks me up, takes me to her house and changes my diaper. This was an important thing because years later she would say, Mickey, my nickname, your mother makes coffee like PG water. Mother Beta knows how to make coffee. You come to my house, I'll give you some good coffee. So five years old, four years old, I started drinking coffee with my best baby. <laughs> I didn't know that, that the biscuits we were eating were dog biscuits, but she liked them and I liked them. <laughs> and she became like my other mother. Now, this is a woman who worked at the Reformed Temple serving on Sabbath Eve, hmm. the Sabbath uh, celebration. She says, those goddamn Jews. And my father said, Bader, I'll kick you out on your ass if you talk about being Jews like that. He later found out that there was some far relatives who claimed to be Jewish, and he got back at her that way. She came to my ordination when I was a rabbi. I'll come back where I need to come back, but she came to my ordination as a rabbi. She became my other mother. I learned something in that. Here's a person who's an anti-Semite, supposedly, doesn't like Jews. She came to my ordination, and she stood up to me eyeball to eyeball. She says, Mickey, Mother Bader loves you. You'll make a wonderful rabbi for your people. That's a, that's a story that's true. So I learned something from that. Important. You can't just stereotype people. She was my other mother. She taught me how to grow a garden. Now, some of the garden was facing her house. That's okay with me. It was on the side of our house. We didn't own the house. We were renting it anyway. But she taught me how to garden. She taught me the things my parents didn't teach me. What a lesson. If I had been in a segregated, segregated neighborhood of all Jewish people, I would have missed something about life. Or where people, I live with people who are poor, and that made a difference in my life of saying, you know, because people don't have a lot. I have friends who have a lot of money. I have friends who don't have a lot of money. One of my schoolmates growing up became a multimillionaire, and Rob has been talking with him, too, because he's, he's an interesting guy. We, we got back together years later. We hadn't seen each other in years. We were both living in California at that time. And when he was in high school, he was considered a dweeb. Uh, he had a certain operation that changed something in relation to his body. And he then also studied, uh, ended up at Harvard, ended up uh, becoming an aeronautical engineer, becoming a multimillionaire, and, and, and we're friends again. And it's been an interesting relationship because we both grew up as poor kids. He lost his father very young. His mother was very bitter, bringing up two kids. And he becomes a person that I meet when I'm living on $50 a month, or maybe even less in my hippie days. And, and he's living on, he said, I can't live on less than, I don't know, 20,000 a month or something like that. And it's like, it has to do with relationships and people, you know? And uh, we're still friends and, and, and Rob has been talking with him too. Um, and it's all about people, it's about human beings. And so I'm a Jew, and I also belong to the Thich Nhat Hanh Sangha. I love that man, I love that teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. And I, I, I also uh, studied world religions, and I taught world religions. I taught for a number of years at the University of Colorado. I started the Jewish Studies program. They had no Jewish professors at the University of Colorado when I came. I was appalled. How can you not have somebody 
teaching Jewish culture. And how about Islamic culture? How about our Islamic brothers and sisters? We don't understand their culture. Among the Sufis, I have also connected. And I have connection with an Orthodox rabbi who survived the Holocaust, who's the father of the whole Jewish renewal movement, Zalman Shekhtar Shalomi. He's right now been in the hospital. We just met again. We hadn't seen each other for a number of years. And since I'm in my 80s, beginning of my 80s, I'm in the beginning of the 80s, right? <laughs> Past 80, 82 and four months into my 80s. Robin says I'm only 79. <laughs> That's because she's counting from when you said you were born. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, be so, that as it may. Um, so the you mentioned your hippie days. How exactly did those begin? I always learn from my students. I was at the University of Texas, and it was an interesting time. It was the psychedelic era, mm. and there was a psychologist, a psychiatrist, who was a Holocaust survivor. She named Dr. Harry Herman. He used to speak like Boris Badenov. Hello, how are you? Get on the phone. Hello, how are you and why? He's <laughs> quite a character. He was the only doctor legally allowed to use psychotropics in private practice until two days after my wedding. So I don't forget that. And he came to my wedding stoned out, stoned out and taking pictures of people's nostrils. Uh, but he also taught me some things. And I said, I'm interested to know why my students are doing this. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to be judging my students. I want to understand why are people doing this? It doesn't make sense. He said, with his accent, I cannot, I can skip the accent here. He said, I'll give you important books by Aldous Huxley. I want you to read these, we'll discuss these, and it'll begin to give you an understanding of what this is about and why people are doing this. And at that point, I said, I'd be interested in having an experience, but I don't know about this acid stuff. He said, I wouldn't give you that. It has a lot of bad parts to it too. What you want to do is mescaline. <laughs> so, and, and a lot of rabbis since that time have done that too and became rabbis after that so I said tell me about Mescal he said I'll give you this stuff to read you'll read, we'll discuss it and when you're ready I'll get you pure moksha pure stuff and so uh, nothing, you, and I had an experience and it was it went for over 12 hours <laughs> and the first part of it, I was in silence, but I was wowing. Oh, I'm not an agnostic rabbi. I get it. We're all a part of the oneness of all being. That's what it's about. It's not about God on a throne. That's rather infantile. It's not Mr. God on a throne. It's that we're all, as we're all cells of God being. Will we acknowledge it or will we not? I actually wrote my doctorate on a, a project about this. I wasn't looking for a doctorate, but I wanted to take a break from the intensity of that era. And I said to myself, well, what are you interested in? And I need to get a grant. How can I do this? And it's, well, what are you interested in? I'm interested in somehow finding out the roots within the Jewish tradition of the mystical part of the tradition. I never studied that in reform school in my, as a reform rabbi. So, uh, I, um, someone delivered medicine. I had been up all night playing music with my friends. I, I do sing and play a little recorder. And so I came home, it was like four in the morning. We had a wonderful musical night with my friends. And someone was there, a student said, Dr. Herman asked me to deliver this to you. I said, what is it? She said, it's, it's the moksha, it's the, it's the mescaline. She said, would you like to take that now? And I said, I've been up all night playing music. I want to go sleep. She said, I'll tell you what. I know you like lasagna. And um, if you take it now, you'll get over your tiredness. But what will happen for you, you'll really have your journey. And I'll stay out of your way. And that's what happened. And it was a good 11, 12 hours. And it was an experience that changed my life. And I got a warning on it. This, this, there was this very mellifluous male voice that was guiding me through, and I got stuck in certain places. 
to this day, I don't know what that voice was. I don't see Mr. God on the throne kind of thing. It was obviously some inner voice, but it was very soothing and calming to go beyond, let go here. It just, it had a wisdom that I certainly didn't think I had. So it represented some part of the psyche. I don't, I can't explain it. I still to this day can't explain it. But I was seeing things. I saw the pain that my children were having in my divorce from their, from their mother. And uh, it was quite, quite a moving experience that really changed me. And um, during this trip, there was one part of it where we were being, uh, we were being ra rounded up to be exterminated by the Nazis. This was on the journey, on, the, on that journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Nazi guard, they did, I mean, I had studied enough of these things to know it was in my psyche. So it's not so strange that these things came up. Um, and there was a Nazi guard and he said, Hey, Jew, he started, or they were lining us up and they shaved the women's heads and they were going to the gas chamber. And uh, I screamed at him at some point. You don't put people in gas chambers. You don't put people on crosses. Don't you get it? He still didn't get it. I looked into his eyes in this journey. It's a journey, it was a psychedelic journey. I looked into his eyes and I had such sadness that people can get to that point where they can be Nazis. They can get to that point where he can say, I've got the gun here and I'm going to play with you. We're going to what they, but you put a gun in one barrel, you don't know which one it's going to be in, and then we'll, we'll play that game. I said, I don't want to play your effing games. You don't get it. It made me very, very sad that we don't get it. That what it means to be a human being is, albeit God and the gorilla, that also came up on the psychedelic journey, that we are all cells of God being in consciousness. It's not Mr. God on the throne somewhere. And the story of the Garden of Paradox, as I call it, is that we have the choice. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. And in my retelling of the story, which was part of my thesis, did you finally get around to eating of that fruit? That super mango? Aha, uh -huh. now the test is yours. Can you know what to do with that power? Do you use it for justice? The key teaching in the Jewish tradition is tzedek, tzedek, terdof. Tzedek, they use this, tzedaka means what? Loving kindness and justice. And how is yeah. justice? Yeah, and, and they use another translation of it is uh, giving to charity. Mm -hmm. If charity connects to the word to care, is it carry to caritas or something like that? I don't remember that. The things I forget. The Latin word, caritas. Yes. Yeah. I took I, I, three I, years I, of Latin. Go check on the other group. Oh. Yeah. Their time is up. So, keep on. Um, if you want to ask other questions, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, keep going, yeah. keep going. I just got to go. I mean, you, you, yeah, this has been. Uh, Right so far. Um, my sa sab I wrote a, my thesis, I wrote a thesis on uh, Sabbath as a corrective of the post-industrial society. That okay. the inner meaning of Sabbath is what our, our culture needs. Where one day a week, you let go of manipulating an I-it way of living. And there are different ways to do this. There are different experiments with it. But the essence of it is it's a time of nurturing being rather than doing not controlling, letting go of trying to master and be master over. And traditionally you make love on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is called the queen. 
ההמרים מושבת, האילנות נסתלקה, והוא לקראת שבת המלכה. סבת הקווין. הנה היא יורדת הקדושה הברוכה. And so on. Uh, it's a day, and a day of play, a day of lightness, a day of... I could go on. I mean, I wrote my dissertation on it. It goes on and on and on. My name is Hanan and on and on, and I don't want to go on too long. But the, that in the Sabbath, I found, and it's interesting because I'm wrestling with it now, this practice has been a long-time practice. Even when I was a little kid and I decided I wanted to go to this Hebrew school, even though it was five days a week, No, it was six, day, six of the seven days a week. The Plainfield Hebrew Institute, an Orthodox place in Plainfield. I went there. I asked my mother to take me. My father said I didn't know. I didn't need to do, know that until my bar mitzvah. I said, I want to go. So besides going to public school, I'd come home from the public school. I'd have something to drink, and then I'd get to get the bus, and I'd go to Plainfield Hebrew Institute. And we're there for, what, two hours. And you learn, of, of the six, of the seven days, six, I went six days a week, and of those days, I trudged through it like everybody else trudged through it, but I did well. Others didn't want to be there. I chose to be there. I made a choice. I also became president of the student body, and what I did with that is say, we got to have some play for the kids. So when the other kids come in, and we're tired, and me too, when we're tired, If we could come earlier and we get permission to leave public school a half hour earlier, is it possible that we could have some time to play in the yard before we come in and learn Hebrew? I bet your students are going to be a lot happier students if you let us do that. It seemed like a small thing, but it was the beginning of my involvement in politics. <laughs> uh, it was very important. And I went for that school for five years. And I learned on Saturday... I love to go Saturday morning. I learned Hebrew prayer, and I didn't know what it meant. And some part of that was good, because I learned the words, but I learned the spirit of it without being, being confined to the words. I don't know if this makes any sense, that somehow the, mu the, the music has been in my family. And so, I came, so I'm starting to go on Friday. I'm starting to go on Saturday morning. And they give us candy bars before we go home. And then we come home and we play ball with each other. I mean, like a regular kid does on Saturday, right? But you go to this thing, you get a Hershey bar, and you get to learn these melodies. Uh, Olat Shabbat, Shabbat 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 de Shabbato. Olat Shabbat de Shabbat, Olat Shabbat de Shabbat. Al Olat HaKamid Venisko. I can't sing like I used to, but, you know, it's like, th 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 these are songs of my heart. I can also sing... It ain't necessarily so. You know, it's, I, I like jazz, too. I love jazz. And there's some wonderful television program that was on recently of showing all the Jewish music that came into jazz through the Jewish immigrants that came to America. It was a very important program shown on OPB. And it ain't necessarily so. That's part of Torah Trump. That expression is what's is chanting in the Torah. They didn't use those words. So that became exciting. I just found that out. I mean, I was knowing it in a way, and I learned about the kind of trope. But it was recently there was an OPB program that showed you the musicians talking about how that particular part of the music came actually from Torah. Saying, far I won't use the F word. Far out. <laughs> far out. So... Um. <clears throat> So how did you, I mean, you apparently started with activism pretty early in the, uh, but how did you move toward the civil rights movement, involvement in that in particular? I became aware of, of, justice, issue, of justice issues as a little kid, uh, of poverty, and uh, my mom is saving in, in the closet. There's 
there's a, a, a little bag and then there's another thing with a box. And I said, what's this? She said, we save this up for insurance because dad was earning what $15 a week. Mm. In the 1940s, that was considered a lot of money, but not a lot, a lot of money. Enough to, so mom would save and she would put, for Mr. Billabrand, the insurance agent, she would have co a coin box. So once a month he came and that was for life insurance for the family. Um, and mom was doing some stuff of saving money for clothing. And then I'd had enough cousins, 22 first cousins, so I could get a lot of old clothing, but I had trouble with my feet, so I had to get a new pair of shoes each year. So she would save up a quarter, a week, or whatever it was. So I learned those kinds of things. Uh, my mother was born and was raised, and her mother died when she was 14 years old. And there were, I don't think it was 10, I think there were eight, eight kids in that family. So those are all part of the, your conditioning as a kid. And my parents, um, they married early and they had a child, my sister. I was born on her sixth birthday. And my parents were selling clothing that my grandfather manufactured himself. And he gave them all these clothes and said, you can earn a livelihood now, except it was 1929. And none of the clothes sold. And my parents had no food. And there was a baby, my sister. And my mom had a nervous breakdown while she was burying her child. She didn't know what to do. How are we gonna survive? And they found a family that had a job and said, we'll share our food with you if you care for our child. And that's what my parents did, care for their neighbor's child. And my dad was looking for a job. And then when he ended up finding a job, it was through a relative, a cousin. He became afraid to move in his life, to take any risks. So he was very conservative about the work thing, and that was why I had an uncle who was a pharmacist that, you're going to get that store. He invested in property. He became a multimillionaire. You will have success. And I contemplated suicide at my uncle's funeral, on my way to my uncle's funeral, because I went to see the pharmacy professor and said, my mom was upset during the night because of this death in the family, and I didn't finish my studies, and I wanted, and the professor screamed at me, how dare you knock at my door at 7.30 in the morning? It was his office door, it wasn't, but I knew he was there at that time. And I got on the Pulaski Skyway, you know that impossible road. There's one in Austin that's like, no, San Antonio that's like that. I hope they've taken them down. And I just thought, I'll close my eyes and go over the edge. I had that one thought, and then it came to me, Hanan, with your luck, You'll live and be broken. Don't be a schmuck. Don't, <laughs> don't be an idiot. You'll do what you have to do with your life. And if your dad's unhappy, you'll have to live with that. And he didn't talk to me for a couple of years. He did help me get parts for my car because he was an auto accessory business at that point. <laughs> but he wouldn't talk to me. Um, and that's just the way it had to be. And I was sad about that. And then when I was finally a rabbi at a certain point, he said... I'm proud of you. And I, I looked at him because I was in a rich congregation and earning a lot of money and he knew I'd be safe. And he wasn't. I later realized as a teaching in the Jewish tradition and I've worked all this crap out with my father before he died. And since then, I've really, really deeply forgiven him. And I realized what he lived through was a difficult time and he followed a Jewish teaching. Then it was only about your son. Now it would also be your daughter, thank God. You teach your son two skills so he doesn't starve to death or doesn't steal. You teach him how to swim and you teach him how to earn a livelihood. Two important things to know. And that's what my father was trying to do. I had forgotten that teaching, even though I'm a rabbi. I was so angry with him. Then I realized that's what he was trying to do. And uh, I'm glad it happened because it helped me to make a choice in my life. And I was thinking of actually doing something else. I was offered a job. I was taking ROTC. You know what ROTC is. Mm -hmm. I had to take ROTC in Rutgers. I thought I had completed it. They said, no, because you transferred, you lost the year. I said, but they told me I only needed one. You've got to take ROTC. 
I said, you're going to keep me back a whole other year from graduating? So I said, I'm not going to take this. So I went to see, um, he used to be on television, the guy that used to be at Rutgers University, and he was on a quiz show. Oh, yeah. M M uh, he was the president. Uh, the pre he was the president, president of the university. He was the president. The mustache. Yes. He had a mustache. Whatever his name was. <laughs> so I went to see him, and I said, look, this is what happened. They're going to keep me back here because of ROTC. Now, my, my roommate did something that I didn't have the chutzpah to do. He said, I want to be in ROTC, but I, uh, I refused to do it because, well, that's where I got radicalized, too. In pharmacy school, we had a Jewish professor who taught physics. Why should he be kicked out of the school? Because they claim Joseph McCarthy, motherfucker. I'm sorry for my language, but I'm not sorry for him because that's what he was. He gave this man hell, took his job away from him. That really radicalized me because this was a great teacher and a man whom I loved. He was also a Jew boy. And even if he wasn't a Jew boy, he was a human being. You don't treat people like that. And he came before the Rutgers, and I went from Newark Rutgers to New Brunswick with some other students to march for him. Mason that, Gross. Mason Gross, that's the man. <laughs> I love that man. <laughs> and they threw tomatoes in our face. They called us every filthy name of commie, commie pigs and so on. The, the right wing folks that came that day because they heard there was gonna be this hearing. And he confessed. He said, I was a member of the Communist Party in 1920, whatever it was. But I left it because I found out a lot of things that don't work in that way. So I left it. But I refused to testify before Joseph McCarthy, period. God damn his ass. He was a terrible man. And only a few stood up to him. And that's one of the main radicalizing moments of my life. That was not okay. You don't treat a human being like that. That bully, that stinking bully, I spit on his face, on his grave, Joseph McCarthy. And he was a great teacher for me. I would never forgotten that. I never will. And the rest is commentary. I don't know. <laughs> I decided uh, not to be, you know, I transferred to Rutgers and I got to be special director of the radio station. I got to do all the theater I ever wanted in my life. Mm -hmm. Won an honor for it. I actually graduated with honors. And was this being special features director of the radio station was the funnest job. And I, I, I was able to announce games and went, went and my classmate, Stanley, trying to remember his name, he was one of the first people, two people ever to split the gene. He, he became mm -hmm. a famous personality, but we both were into jazz. And we took the Rutgers boat ride and I used to interview people at the, uh, you know, I, I had my fun. I, I, I made my... I, I did what I wanted to do, and I, and I loved it, and I enjoyed it, and then it was time to move on. So I had the big decision to make. The fraternity brother who wasn't anti-Semitic was a socialist, and his family were socialists. His wife is Lenny Cotton Pogerman. I know every one of us know who she is. She's one of the originators of the women's movement. I recently saw her and her husband, Bert. He was my fraternity brother that I adored. I only came to the Rutgers my last two years, but my whole life was lived in those two years. It was great. It was good. And I had a junior c college semester before that to prove that I, I could do well academically. And I ended up with honors. I just didn't want to take pharmacy. So what happened was the Jewish guys in the fraternity were anti-Semitic, some of them. Bert wasn't. And it made me decide at some point, I'm going to go study, not to be a rabbi, but uh, my nose is running. Uh, yeah. Is there anybody got a tissue? In, uh, in the restaurant. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
Now we know why you came. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has to keep the rabbi from being embarrassed and having his nose run all over again. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have a sense of humor. You don't survive. Fortunately, my humor is my humor is corny. So uh, I hope it's not derisive toward anyone. Oh, no. Except I can make fun of myself. God bless some you. Some extras. Better. Okay, we'll have some extras. You'll notice where I'm hiding. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things I would love to ask if, if, there, if there's ever a chance. Should I get to, get to St. Augustine? Yeah. And then okay. We'll, okay. We can, well, so how did you? Oh, I've got to. I've got to. Okay. I've, I've got to tell you about this because. Okay. It, it teaches you how to use humor. My roommate didn't want to take ROTC either. And this is the guy who is a socialist. And he says, I won't do it. They said, he said, I'll march with you. You can't march unless you sign the loyalty oath to McCarthy. You can't do it. It's a land grade college and those are the rules. He said, how about if I march without a uniform? How are you going to do that? He said, I'll march when you march. I promise you. Whenever you have the... And what I'll do, I won't... I can't... You can't issue me a uniform, so I'll dress in my own dress. But I'll march 50 yards behind you or 25 yards behind you. So I'll do everything. I promise I'll be there every time. And he never missed a one. He wore red clothing. <laughs> Remember that red was the menace. The communists wear red. So <laughs> Jerry Jacobs... Bless you, Jerry. He's passed. But that brother taught me a lot. We were roommates. We, 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 were fr we both went to pharmacy school, and we both ended up being roommates. Oh, when they didn't have enough room at Rutgers in my first semester, they had us, women, they had us living in the women's side of the college, at Douglas College, on the, where, where the women were housed. And Jerry and I ended up as roommates there, the guys who was in my pharmacy school, who taught me how to have humor when you're making social change, not just rage. So Jerry did it by wearing red outfits and marching with the ROTC. <laughs> I passed my ROTC. <laughs> and I said, why didn't I have the guts and the balls to do that? But I did something. I went to the president of the university, whose name was- Mason Gross. Mason Gross, and I explained the situation. And he said, we'll work it out. Hmm. If you can take an inter, and I said, there's a pre-rabbinical study camp this summer, and I don't know if I want to be a rabbi, but I want to go to this school. I, st I first applied for the conservative seminary, and they said, you have to sign that you're going to keep kosher, and you're going to do this Sabbath. And I said, I'll give you my word, but I ain't signing any more loyalty oaths. If you can't take me as I am with my word of honor, then I'm at the wrong seminary. And I left immediately. And I went to reform school, uh, the reform seminary, <laughs> the reform movement. And I'm glad I did, because it made a difference. And I brought my book that Dr. Bre uh, this book that my favorite rabbi in the world, who was with us when we got jailed, Rabbi Eugene Borowitz. And he talks about it in this book, that in the reform movement was the sense of, we're proud of our tradition, but we also embrace our universality. Mm. That's the gift of reform Judaism. How did you get to St. Augustine? Can you describe that process? Let me go back to that. St. Augustine. I was, okay, I've been Marine Corps chaplain and we got out, we didn't go to war with Cuba, thank God. And I was in this 4,700 people congregation and I hadn't yet decided to switch to Austin. And the reason I would switch to Austin was because of civil rights. Okay, I'm getting back to remembering this. And so the congregation said to me, this was my second year in the congregation in Milwaukee, this congregation of 4,700 people. I was the associate rabbi in charge of the youth group. And the senior rabbi said, called me Mickey, my nickname, Mickey, you are entitled to go to the Reform Rabbi's Convention. I hadn't gone the first year, we had just had a new baby, but he said, you can go. 
and we'll pay for it. Where is it going to take place? In Atlantic City. Atlantic City is New Jersey. I'm a Jersey boy. Oh, I'm going to get a new bathing suit. And I went to Atlantic City. And I show up, and I walk in, and Rabbi Israel Dresner walks in. I used to ride the Long Island Railroad because we both had Hebrew teaching jobs, and I came to have great respect for him. Great respect for him because of his commitment to social justice. He was one of my important teachers. We just spoke on the phone and was, I'm thrilled. Is he, is he here? He'll be here a little later in the afternoon. Okay. I taught Sunday school for him. That's, oh, he's, that, I came for you and for him. Oh my God. Oh, Cy Dresner is a hero to me. He and Borowitz are. Borowitz was my and, dad's and, hero. And Levy, Richard Levy. Great respect from Richard. Richard touched my son's life in a way. So my fun son was playing with Theo Bacall last night in a major concert. My son is a musician, and he gets his Jewishing through music, definitely. Got to get back to, you got to get back to St. Augustine. Okay, this takes us to St. Augustine now. So how did I get to St. Augustine? I go to the rabbi's conference, and I show up in Atlantic City, I got my new bathing suit, and I know the next day I'm gonna be out swimming. We just arrive. And announcements are being made, and Israel Dresner walks in, and he stands up in front of those who were there. Not everybody was there yet. People were still coming. And he waves this piece of paper. This is a telegram for Martin Luther King. He needs your help. It may not be the exact words, but that's the pith of it. So I start, I'm starting to leave, and I, I couldn't leave. I just said... So if I'm in a big room, let's say this is a big room, I'm back over here, and I start to move a little bit closer to hear what he's announcing, because everybody, everybody's talking at the same time. They, they had just had a, a business introduction to people, and, and people are talking. And Sai is waving this thing, and I'm starting to get closer, and I'm getting closer, and I'm finally right there where, they're, where he's standing. Martin Luther King needs your help because they're still lynching people. They're still lynching people. Immediately what comes to mind is the Holocaust. This is, this can't be, this can't be happening. This can't be happening in America? Are you crazy? That's crazy. This is the Holocaust in America? You're crazy. I'm a Jew boy. We don't kill people. What's, what is this nut stuff? It's not right. Those are the things I was feeling inside of me. And I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I sorry. Right. I, uh, it blew me away. And I start to get into conversation with some people in the hallway. I didn't make it upstairs. I'm, I'm in the hallway. You know, the, the, the meeting had broken up. They were saying, we're all going to meet for supper at such and such a time. Uh, 20 minutes from now, do you go to your rooms, bring your suitcases? So this was just the very beginning of everything. And this announcement comes through. A lot of people didn't even hear it. And it's now this moment. And I had promised to call my wife when I got there to let her know I was safe. And I called her and I said, by the way, there's been this call by Martin Luther King. And I explained it to her. And... Uh, I may go to St. Augustine at his call. And she said, you can't do that. We have two children that are, inf that are basically infants. You're talking about possibility of getting killed and you have two babies? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You think this was an easy decision? You can make this decision for their fa your family? How dare you do that? So I said, I hear you. We're going to have a conversation. And I'll get back to you. Bring this up a little bit. Keep the sound a little crisper. At, at that point, Rabbi Borowitz was walking in. I think he had just arrived because people were still coming, traveling from where, all over the country to, to this conference, the CCR conference. And at that moment, 
I stopped him in the elevator and I said, Frank Fisher, a Holocaust survivor when he was an infant, his parents escaped from Europe, just said, don't go. You think it's going to be bad for the African Americans? Do you know what some of these bigots feel about Jews? They don't like the Jews any, bit, any, any better than Hitler liked the Jews. And you're willing to do this and then leave town and leave us with this? Are you crazy? So first my wife is saying this. Now this rabbi, Borowitz shows up. My hero, I love Borowitz. He, he gave me gifts. And there's something in this book I, I'm rereading and I know his daughter's coming and I would like to share with her because he talks about the gift of the universe, universalism of the reform movement. And uh, that's for Eugene. Uh, I love that man and always will. He, uh, he came with us. He said he would drop his bed and he came down not intending to go with us at that point, but intending to have the conversation. The conversation, as I remember, was with myself, this young man who said, don't go, and possibly three more. I don't think there were five. There might have been four or five of us total, not the whole group of rabbis, because they weren't there then. They were in another place. Some had already decided. Some were packing up in the room. But it was like, these are the people who are in that vicinity. This is the question that came up on the elevator. Borowitz was the man who was there. So he, he consented, dropped his suitcase off, came down, joined us, and we talked a good portion of the night. As I remember, we never had, because after all of this, was packing my bag to go. But it was at that meeting that we had the conversation that Gene held forth to help us to make that decision. And in the end, he said, he always teased me about this, he said, and I'm going to go to me. Because up to then he didn't know it was even happening because he had walked in at that point. So this was the pivotal moment that the decision was reached. How can we not go? So I called my wife and I said, I've got to go. Rabbi Boros is coming with me. She knew who he was and respected him. Because he, he said to me, you got me to go to jail with you. He teased me about that and I said, you also got me permission for my wife to go to jail. <laughs> she wasn't exactly giving permission, but she respects you and she knows that I love and respect you. So, and I don't remember whether it was me or someone else in the end before we left. I think I and some others said before we leave, because all of us wasn't at that discussion that we stayed up that night. I'd like to know from every person who went, why did you go for each of us? And that's, you, you know the story of that. And they did do that. And every one of us said it was because of the Holocaust. We can't allow that to happen again. It's not a matter of just Jews. It's a matter of human beings, period. Oh, uh, so if I were to ask one thing, it would be, I, I know you're into elder a lot. How about the bigger picture of like someone who would going to be involved in a civil disobedience or some kind of a event like this. Maybe just drawing on your wisdom from what happened in St. Augustine. I know you went home and there were issues. You had things you told me. Things got shot out. You were threatened. Oh yeah, when I got home uh, uh, can I share just, just a piece of that? When I got home for, first of all, I didn't come right home. I had to take 24 hours or 36 hours. I forget what it was. I got to the airport in Chicago and I said this was intense, <laughs> you know, putting it mildly. I think the plane ride was also bumpy, you know. I said, i got to settle myself down and figure out what just happened. What, what did I just live through? I want to be in quiet. So I, I was near an airport, but I went out for a long walk in the countryside because the airports sometimes have these places where you can go. And I spent a day or two just hanging out. Then it was time to come home. And I came home, and what faced me was... I come home, and there in, uh, where was I? Are you still around? Austin, was I in Austin? I said, where, where was I living then? Milwaukee. Milwaukee. I was still in yeah. Milwaukee, okay. So I was, thank you. My memory goes, comes and goes. So I was in Milwaukee, I was coming back to Milwaukee, and Milwaukee had an interesting community. There were people 
who were socialists who had been a family. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name because one of their kids used to kid stuff for had a, a whole tradition of socialism and like mayors upon mayors of that family. And so I always looked at Milwaukee as a very progressive community. It had its different neighborhoods and there were things going on. So I come home and there are these people waiting in the airport for me and they descend on you and they're like, it's old American. So I was like, oh, well, I get home. I said to my wife, let's get away for a couple of days. Let's call Dudley. I can't, this has been an intense experience. Let's go away with the kids. We'll reconnect just the two kids and the two of us. And we had a car that I would use and sometimes a car that she would use. So we left one in the garage and we went off for 48 hours. When I came back, the windows of the back of my house were shot out. My car was bullet, bullet, bulleted with bullets. Um, death threats, oh, they, the synagogue was down the block from my house. My windows in the synagogue were shot out. They knew who I was, they knew where my office was, and they shot out the windows of my house, and death threats were left. That if I continue to do what I'm doing, they will kill me. And first they're gonna start with my kids. And they named my kids. This is what I came back to face. That was after, after the experience and after going aside with my wife for two days and came back to face that. I said, I've gotta call the FBI, which is what I did, and thank God. And I still was involved in civil rights. I wasn't putting my name out in the world, but here in Milwaukee, a bastion of progressivism. That's the same place, if you remember, during an election, uh, one of the arch conservatives surprised Kennedy. I'm trying to remember all the people in that script, but they were having the preliminaries. What do they call that before? Primaries. The prime, they were having the primaries, and one very conservative guy, a super conservative, bigoted kind of guy, ended up having some crazy person shoot him. Wallace was his name? That wasn't in Milwaukee. No, he wasn't in Milwaukee, but he was running in the primary for the United States yeah. for the United States president. I know we have to leave the room, but maybe you could just sum up sum up your uh, St. Augustine experience. Just like what it, what it's meant for you. I did decide to move to the south. That was important. I decided to move to a place in the South where you can make a difference. I wasn't going to go to Mississippi, but I knew about Austin. My Kinky Fried was one of my closest friends, and Kinky's father was a social psychologist, and Kinky has got a lot going for him. He plays the Schmagegi sometimes, but I know the family that he comes from, and I know what he stands for, and I was, I was his student when he was my student at the University of Texas. We became very, very close. And uh, I hope he can become governor of Texas. I don't know that he can. He's write, written a book. So because of St. Augustine, you wanted to live in the South. I made the decision to live in the South. But in a place in the South, I could make a difference. But that was also before the Vietnam War. So that brought in, that's another story and another chapter for another time. But yeah. definitely, you know, it's like, oh, I didn't even know when I went to seminary that I wanted to become a rabbi. I know I didn't. I know that one of the things that pointed me in that direction was the self-hatred that some of the Jews had, who were my fraternity brothers. They still voted me to be the social director, but I decided to become the Hillel, the Hillel president. I decided to identify myself as a Jew, unabashedly so, maybe to teach Jewish studies. I was offered a job by one of the men who brought Jackie Robinson into baseball. So that was a big choice in my life. I almost didn't become a rabbi. That was the other choice. Do I work for this man who, it's because, because I didn't have the ROTC credits, they said, if you go to school in the summer with a special interest session, and I found a man who was teaching at a college in California, who was the man who, who brought Jackie Robinson into baseball. He was a human relations expert. And he's, he liked me, we got along well, and he said, you can be my associate, I'll teach you this field. I said, I'm very tempted, but I feel like I gotta study this Jewish thing before I do anything else. 
And that was the decision I made. But these two days, we're honoring 16 rabbis that took action. That's right. I know you say we're not the heroes and that the, the kids, the, the people here were the heroes, but what do you want to say about, about the fact that what, what you guys did? Well, it's, it's the Jewish teaching of tzedek, tzedek, tzedek. You've heard the term tzedakah, give to tzedakah. People think it seems to me as money. And sometimes, yes, when people don't have food, you give tzedakah that way. But tzedakah comes to the word tzedek. Tzedek, tzedek, terdof. Righteousness, righteousness, so should you pursue. Some people don't like the word righteousness because it brings up self-righteousness. Okay, how do I deal with that? The same Hebrew word that's translated as righteousness can be translated justice, justice shall you pursue. Tzedek, tzedek. Run after it. Go for it. That's what you do. That's what we must do. It's not... Beth Rose, our friend, the student, uh, doesn't like self-righteousness. So I said, you can translate it as justice. That's really its root meaning. Justice, justice shall you pursue. That's the sum of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.